Amen. Amen. Christ is Lord. He is beautiful. His character is beautiful. Amen. We're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10 verses 1 through 4. Of course, this covers Isaiah chapter 9 verse 8 all the way to Isaiah chapter 10 verse 15. This is a section and I'm taking sections because it's a big book. Um, and, um, but I love preaching through a book because it teaches me. I think when, I, when sermons are scattered, I, I, don't, I don't learn as well. I don't know about you, but that's me. Isaiah chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Hear the word of the Lord. Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees and the writers who keep writing oppression to turn aside the needy from justice and to rob the poor of my people of their right, that widows may be their spoil and that they may make the fatherless their prey. What will you do on the day of punishment in the ruin that will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your wealth? Nothing remains but to crouch among the prisoners, to fall among the slain. For all this his anger has not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. The word of the Lord. Amen. You got to praise him for these too, you know. Let's go to him in prayer. Father God, what a joy it is to preach your word. When we hear of your love, we rejoice. When we hear of your righteous anger, we rejoice. Because we know that you defeat evil. And that you have given a remedy for sin through Jesus Christ. Let us be a people that do not only see the good side, but how you're in the good side and the things that we may see as bad and how you're turning them to good. We just thank you for how you're going to minister to us through the power of your spirit so that we can rejoice over all that you teach. We do ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I am sure that if you know anything about Jonathan Edwards, you know about his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And of course, we just all love reading that sermon, don't we? Because it, uh, we always think, wow, this is a quintessential fire and brimstone sermon that he preached. He preached it on July 8th, 1741, through the time of the Great Awakening. And get this, many came to the Lord because he spoke of God's righteous anger against sin and against evil and how the remedy is only Christ and that you need to turn to Christ unless you face his terrible wrath against sin. That's good news, isn't it? Now you go, well, that's good news for July, but not for Christmas, not during Christmas. Pastor Bob, I just preach the text. That's all I do. Preach the text. So, but it is good news. Isn't that what Christmas is about? Isn't it about the fact? See, we got this old-fashioned idea that the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. We have this weird idea about that. But isn't Christmas about the fact that Jesus came not just to show the love of God, but to face the wrath of his Father for our sin? Isn't that part of the Christmas message too, that we rejoice over? Or am I the only one rejoicing over the fact that I'm not receiving God's wrath? Whew. See what I'm saying? Yes, the Bible says that God is love. It never says that God is anger. 1 John 4 makes that clear. God is love. But you cannot appreciate his love unless you appreciate his wrath, his anger, his perfect righteousness, and how he will defeat evil and punishes evil and sin. In fact, last time I checked, Jesus got angry. And if you don't believe me, well, then I would suggest you look through the New Testament and just focus on the Pharisees and what he says to the Pharisees. If you don't think he got angry. But here's the thing. God's anger is not cruelty. 
It's humility. You go, how is it humility? He doesn't just come into the world through his love. He comes into the world through his righteous anger against evil and sin. Why do we only think that he invades into our lives in love? Isn't, it, isn't there loving anger? Isn't righteous anger loving? See, we got to rethink the, the way we think that he's willing to be involved. And besides, Jesus, Jesus conquered it. He conquered evil. He conquered sin. By going to the cross for you and me. That's the Christmas message, isn't it? He, he came into the world for a purpose. He was born into the world for a purpose. To save you and me. So that's something to be grateful for. Don't see his wrath, his anger as vindictiveness. It's not vindictiveness. It's like a doctor who cuts out a disease. The disease is sin. The disease is evil. And he comes into the world to deal with that. He's involved. You can't appreciate, you can't understand his grace. It remains incomplete for you unless you understand what you deserve and what I deserve, which is God's wrath, his righteous anger. But Jesus took that for me and for you, and that is something to rejoice over. Amen? Amen. That's what I've been talking about for the last I don't know how many sermons. How God's grace triumphs over our failures, right? He did it with Isaiah in chapter six. Well, it was me. I'm a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. He did it over the sin of Judah in chapter seven, verse one, all the way to chapter nine, verse seven. And now over Israel or Ephraim's, sometimes those words are used interchangeably. Chapter nine, verse eight, all the way to chapter 11, verse 16. Wait until the 24th. We're going to talk about rejoicing and all that stuff, right? I already know where I'm going, all right? So rejoice over God's passion to defeat evil, to defeat sin. Rejoice over that. Amen? Or am I talking to myself? Amen. If that's not the message of Christmas, then let's take down the lights, return the gifts, and burn the Christmas tree because it's about God. It's about Jesus. I got a little sign on my lawn. Happy birthday, Jesus. Because it's about him. Right? Amen. That he has demonstrated his loving kindness toward us. It's not just what we rejoice over, what he gave us, but what we escaped from due to his loving kindness. All right, now let's look at this phrase because, you know, this phrase is what is repeated four, four times in chapter 9 and 10, this phrase, for all this, his anger has not turned away and his hand is stretched out still. It's repeated four times. Chapter 9, verse 12. Chapter 9, verse 17. Chapter 9, verse 21. And chapter 10, verse 4. Why would he repeat that four times if it wasn't important? If we're just supposed to gloss over it? If we're just to say, supposed to have sermons that only say the positive and never say the negative. I mean, it's in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. It's important. God's hand is stretched out like a judge who's ready to bring down the gavel, right? To make pass sentence. Or see it as a royal official who has a ceremonial mace in their hand, you know, like Queen Elizabeth, the gold thing that, you know, you're pardoned, Right? Or go away to jail. Boom, you know. They put that little ceremonial mace, that gold thing, that's probably worth a lot of money, by the way. Right? That demonstrates the, this idea. His, in fact, some versions will say his hand is lifted up still, ready to come down in judgment. All right, so why? What did Israel do? What did the northern kingdom of 12 tribes, it's sometimes called Ephraim, what did they do? Well, here's the first thing they did. It was their arrogance. They were arrogant, which leads God always to humble them. All right, look with me, because you're going to have to follow me here. Chapter 9, verse 10. Look there in the Bible. It says this. The bricks have fallen, but we will build with dressed stones. The sycamores have been cut down, 
but we will put cedars in their place. What is that talking about? It's talking about that Israel suffered a military attack. People were dead in the streets. Things were cut down. And what do the people of Israel do? They laugh it off. They laugh it off. God's trying to get their attention. Something's wrong. And they laugh it off. Because see, they believe they can make Israel great again. Huh? I don't know where that came from. Uh, <clears throat> but in fact, they, oh, you finally got it. All right. In fact, <clears throat> they thought they could make it even greater than the past. Even though God was trying to get their attention, something's wrong. You need to repent. You need to turn back to me. And I'm doing it by the Assyrians. Yeah. Just laugh it off. <clears throat> How many people know who Winston Churchill was? See, I'm going to keep teaching you history. Okay? Winston Churchill wrote a lot of volumes on World War II. And in one of those volumes, he said regarding the Second World War, he said this, How the great democracies triumphed and so were able to resume the follies which had so nearly cost them their lives. What arrogance. What lack of humility that we go back to the very thing that almost destroyed us because we feel that God is not involved in history and is not trying to get our attention through the fact that he sometimes demonstrates his loving anger to get our attention. We need to go back to him. He is the one who is our help and our redeemer. Amen? And that's what he's trying to bring us back to through this, through history. So, because he wants all people to repent and to be saved. He doesn't just do that by just pouring out good things. Here's the second reason. Verses, chapter 9, verses 13 through 17, they praise their leaders rather than God. They believed, and I mentioned this in the last few sermons, they thought the leaders were their rescuers. Now, here's the thing, the one thing I've learned about myself and about people that we say a lot of good things about. We try to resist that we're not all that great. But the truth is, we like believing that we're that great. And so, the more you say how great I am, right? Which I'm not saying you say it a lot, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but that was, that was a joke. That was a joke. But <laughs> what, what I'm saying is, no matter how much we try not to believe it, we begin to believe it. And what happens is we're so afraid to lose that praise that we're that great. We will do what makes you, keeps you saying that we're that great, even when doing the opposite, even though it's unpopular, is what is best. And that is what these leaders do. And forgive me, some of our leaders today do because they're all into being popular. It's all about the vote. It's not about the conviction of what is best for the United States of America, what is best for the people. Return to God. And if you don't you want to believe that, then take it off the money. Okay, so here's the, I just thought I'd throw that out. Okay, so these are false leaders, political, social, religious leaders. And God says, I'm taking them all away. I want to take them all away because they're worthless. They don't worship me. They don't care about me. They don't talk about me. They don't draw people to me. And so I'm going to take them all away. And the weak nor the strong will receive anything from my hand because you have trusted in the leaders. Now, here's the third reason, which I think especially we need to take attention. They lack brotherly love. They forgot the covenant. One tribe was attacking another tribe. Ephraim was attacking Manasseh and so on and so forth. They were attacking one another. It was like in the day of judges. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes, right? That's, that's what occurred. And get this, of the last six kings of Israel, five came to power by assassination. Brotherly love 
was lost. See? So all the tribute that the Assyrians demanded caused the Israelites and the people of Judah to scramble to save their own necks, even if it meant stealing from their neighbor or someone in their own family. And when society breaks down like that, no one is safe. I hear this all the time now that a lot of people are wondering about our own country. Is anyone safe? Is the rule of law still binding in our nation? Well, look, when you start getting into self, that's what's going to happen. If there is no brotherly love, right? Everybody's just looking out for themselves. Here's the last reason. This is in chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. They practice social injustice. That's the text I read. There is no social justice. The prophets often speak of this. When there is little humility, when there's little looking to God and you, look to, you rather look to leaders, there's little brotherly love, social justice becomes rare. And God, get this, becomes angry. When our political systems, our legal systems, our economic systems are used to oppress the poor and also others so, so that others can become rich. That's what God gets angry at. And so God says this. So where your rich is going to be when Assyria comes to call in? They're going to be wiped out. You don't want me? I created you to love me. You find your peace in me? You don't want it? Then take, take what evil really does and the devastation it can cause. And you're going to feel it, right? See, self-seeking always leads to self-destruction, always. Now, don't get this idea that God is only showing his anger towards his people for their evil and their sin. Go to chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. It says, God uses Assyria as the rod of his wrath against the godless nation of Israel. Now, can you imagine these chosen people of God being told by God, you are godless? Just think of that. What, what, what reaction they had. They go, what do you mean? Assyria is the evil one. We're not evil. We're not sinful. They are. Why are you going after, why are you going after us? So God says, well, look, I'm not a respecter of persons. Right? I judge righteously. Right? With showing no favorites. So he says in Isaiah 10, 12, when the Lord has finished all the work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he's at work through his wrath, his anger, to eliminate evil and sin, he will punish the speech of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the boastful look in his eyes. God is perfectly fair. Right? Perfectly right. Acts 17, 30 through 31, we, you heard it for our meditation. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. See, this is the reason. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. God's love and righteous anger work together to bring redemption Huh? Did you ever think about that? To bring redemption. To have this remnant of his disciples. In fact, you see this, and we'll get to it next time. Of, again, he says, I'm going to maintain a remnant. There will be a remnant. And I'm going to do these wonderful things through this remnant. These true followers of me, I will do a mighty work to bring the land back to where it worships me and finds peace and joy through it. That's, that's good news, don't you think? It's good news. God is turning away his anger and seeing to it a remnant of his disciples survive. This reminds us of this fact, that when God uses someone or something else to show us his loving anger against sin, they are only tools in his hand, right? To lead us to speak about him and turn back to him. He doesn't condone the arrogance of the Assyrians. 
He's not condoning that. But he's using it that we need to learn to fear him, right? To trust him rather than others. All right. So let me try to apply all this a little bit more. I've tried to give you some application, but let me give you the rest in the application. How should we respond to this text, to all these texts that talk about God's wrath, God's anger? Well, first of all, we must never think that every time something bad happens to us or bad, something bad happens to somebody we love, that it's God's anger against us, his wrath against us. No, the world is broken because of sin. Bad things happen, right? I would say even to good people, but really none of us are good, right? But you get my point. So it, it, the world is broken. Here's the second thing. We must admit all of us suffer from some form of pride. If you say, I am not prideful, then you're prideful. So we look at Israel, we go, look at how arrogant they were. Well, look at us. You know, we just think all things are just going to remain the same. You know, I can buy what I want to buy. I can do what I want to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, some shock might be coming. We do many things to make ourselves look good. Do you ever think about that? But we're not going to come back from disaster and hardship unless we realize that only God is our help. Right? That means we got to make some realistic assessment of ourselves. We should constantly be assessing ourselves. But we push it away. We push it away. We, we don't like it. Every time I'm sitting there, right, going through the confession of sin, going through the songs, I'm assessing myself, and I come out with the same answer. I'm a sinner. And I need, I can't sometimes even focus for a moment on worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords. What does that say about me? What does that say about you? See, look, it's not just physical behavior that affects the world. Our spiritual behavior affects us in the world. But when we practice what we were designed to do, what the purpose for which God created us, then we find abundance and peace, right? You find great joy when you're doing what you believe God has called you to do. You get great joy from that. You get great peace from that. But if you are not doing, if you're just kind of going along, you, you kind of lose yourself, don't you? I mean, I lose myself even when I miss you know, a Sunday, right? It's like, it's my purpose to worship him in community with God's people. And if we don't seek to fulfill the purpose for which he created us, then there's fatherly discipline to bring us back to that because he wants, wants us to be the best that we can be. I hate to use that phrase. Somebody made that, I don't know. But, you know, he's the one who makes us the best that we can be. Amen? Every artist wants the creation to do what they created it to do. Right? An artist doesn't like to see their painting, you know, whitewashed or, or something like that, right? Why would God want that to happen? No, he wants us. And if you don't know what your purpose is, then you need to do some reflection during the Christmas season. Maybe today you don't go to get some gifts. Unless you're going for Pastor Bob. No, if, but, you know, maybe you reflect a little bit about what is God's purpose for me? Because he created you for a wonderful purpose. And you'll only find peace in fulfilling that purpose. Amen. There's where the joy is. The biggest mistake people make when tragedy or adversity hits them, and this gets to the point of what happened with Israel, is you, you, you must never turn against God or away from God when you have adversity or where you had hardship. Now, let me give you an example of this. Jonathan Edwards. His wife's name was Sarah. Now, you may not know how Jonathan Edwards died. He was the president of Princeton University, and he died in Princeton because he had a bad reaction to the smallpox vaccine. In fact, all of his family had a bad reaction, even Sarah, to the smallpox vaccine, but they lived, he died. And when she got the news, she was writing a letter, and she could hardly write because uh, she was ill, and she was writing to her daughter about the death of her father. 
Now hear these words of what she says. What shall I say? A holy and good God has covered us with a dark cloud. Oh, that we may kiss the rod of discipline and lay our hands on our mouths. The Lord has done it. He has made me adore his goodness that we had my husband so long, but my God lives and he has my heart. Oh, what a legacy my husband, your father, has left us. We are all given to God, and there I am, and love to be. A lot of people don't know this, but Jonathan Edwards was a great man of God, but his wife was even greater. And all the sisters should say amen to that. Look, no matter the what the tragedy, the difficulty. We cannot, we rest with God. Life and joy is with God, not with leaders, right? We must never expect, no matter what, to, give, to have leaders give us security and meaning. It does not help us and it doesn't help the leader because it's always easy to believe what people say, the good and the bad, and then again, you don't want to do the unpopular because you want people to keep saying what's good. And I think this is especially important for pastors, for preachers. We need to preach the whole counsel of God. And we have to stop skipping over texts that we think are unpopular because people only want to hear positive messages. That's helping no one. Because that's not the, that's not the whole gospel. It's not the whole word of God. Just because we want to draw crowds. Well, the great awakening happened through a sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Hello? He came to make disciples who imitate his teaching of self-sacrifice and brotherly love. And what does he say? He says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. I think the church has to counteract these affinity groups that are forming around, uh, you know, come with me because we all agree, right? And then anybody who doesn't agree with us, we oppose, right? <clears throat> we, uh, because they're not into our own self-interest and they don't care about the common good of all people. They only care about what their group needs. The church counteracts that, right? We're not threatened by people who maybe don't believe in Jesus. We try to tell them why we do. We don't form our affinity groups. We're one body, right? And then others here, <clears throat> they become an island unto themselves. You know, they believe their own voice. Look, to say you're somebody because I say so has got to be the dumbest thing on the planet. You and I are somebody because Jesus, the Father sent Jesus to die for us so that we might worship him in spirit and in truth. I don't have to tell myself I'm somebody. I already know I'm somebody because Jesus says I'm somebody. It's because of him, right? And I mean, what really helps you is the fact that Romans 7, 18, Paul says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. The church must never put self above God and others, right? Jesus said the primary way we show the world we are his disciples is that we love one another, right? We are a body. We are a family. Now, I've told you about my wife and the Amish. She really likes the Amish, okay? That's why we go to Lancaster, yeah. And one of the things she says is she likes to hear the trotting of the horses, you know, when their hoofs hit the pavement because she says hearing that go by, the buggies, the Amish buggies, it gives her this sense of peace of a former time when things were not so complicated and so hectic. Now, showing that we're different, what I like about the Amish is the fact that they come together for the common good. Now, I don't agree with the do all the doctrine of the Amish people, okay? But if a barn needs to be built, 
they come together and build that barn. In fact, you may not know this, because I, if you never went to Lancaster, but the, one of the Christian places we went to, that family lost their barn. They were an Amish, but the Amish came and helped them build the barn. And by the way, they don't use uh, circular saws. They use their hand. With the hand. Well, not their hand, but you know what I mean. The, the saw. I mean, look, could you imagine that hand? Okay, but no, it's, it's yeah. yeah. Right? I mean... It's just amazing to me. Of that. And then they have this fellowship time, you know, food and drink. The time that I love the best is when brothers, yes, and sisters get together on a project. I like that. Now, a lot of us don't know what they're doing, uh, kind of like my carpentry skills. Uh, we don't know what we're doing. And sometimes we may even get frustrated with one another. But that's the body. That's the community. Why do we think, I, I, I always hear people say what they're mad about about the church. Look, you're filled with broken people. You're filled with sinners. They're, you're not going to always like them. You're not going to always like what they I mean, come on, man. That's part of community. You know, get over it. You know? And I like what one elder said recently. He told me, and it's about no one keeping score. Just because you did something to me, for me doesn't mean that I got to do something for you. That's body. That's community. That's family. That's what we are. And we have to realize that, right? That's, that's the beauty of that. You know, if, if we say, since I did this for you, you need to do this for me. How does that have anything to do with Christmas? But more importantly, how does that have anything to do with Christianity? Right? Jesus came to build a loving community called the church so that we keep ourselves from becoming like Israel that was selfish. Jesus came to change the individual to be like him, like God intended. Jesus did not start with a nation. He didn't start with a society. He started with an individual. And that recovery, and that individual, if they obey God's word, if they truly believe in Jesus Christ, then you have change, just from that one individual. And if you want a recovery of any church, if you want a recovery of your life, you want a recovery of any nation, it starts with you. It starts with me. We need to stop blaming America for all the problems we have, and especially the church. It starts with you. It starts with me. And I have to look at myself and my own sin and be willing to say, hey, I got to stop that. I got to stop thinking that way. It starts with me. That, that, that's the gospel, right? I mean, isn't that what Jesus, when he gave the Beatitudes, you remember that thing I just preached on, the Beatitudes, you know, Sermon on the Mount? Isn't that what that's about? The secret of happiness and blessedness is what? Is taking these general principles that he gave us and making it a part of our personal discipleship. He calls us to be salt and light in the world. That's what he calls us to do. We're the purifying, purifying agent. We're the light source in the midst of darkness in the world. That means we have to love one another to show the world we're different. And if we set aside God's word, we receive his displeasure. It messes up life. It messes up our marriages. It messes up everything. We need to realize the answer is with God. It is always with God. Because if we don't do this, then we're leaving the world into inevitable corruption and inevitable darkness. That's the Christmas mandate. You want a Christmas mandate? That's it. Be the light of the world. Be the salt of the earth in your families, in your church, in your community. That's the way to do it. So I'll end here. Okay? Anybody see that Hello commercial? The app, Hello. Does anybody know what that is? It's a prayer app. Uh, <clears throat> you know who Jonathan Rumi is, right? He is the actor who plays Jesus in the series. The Chosen. He comes in to the front door. It's a commercial for Hello. Hello, the app. Hallowed be thy name. He comes into the front door and he's carrying all these presents and the shopping bag and all this stuff, right? And all of a sudden he just drops it. Just drops it. And he says, Christmas 
is not about presence. It's about Jesus. And his whole point is, spend the time in the season praying. And I agree with him. That's a way to rejoice over what you have in Christ Jesus. But it's also one way we can rejoice. Another way we can rejoice is that we come into Christmas rejoicing over God's love and wrath being displayed in the life and death of Jesus Christ. Because that's what happened. He took the wrath of the Father for us so that we could worship him in spirit and truth. That is something to rejoice over. His wrath has redemptive purposes. And reflecting and rejoicing over both of these attributes, I hope will make us more thankful for Christmas this season than maybe even past seasons because of what Jesus did for us. Let's pray. Father God, I ask that you would use this sermon in the lives of your people and in my life so that I might remember what you've done for me and for my brothers and sisters in sending Jesus Christ for us. We just thank you that you turned away from your wrath from us and put it upon your son so that we might know the wonder of your love. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.